Hello, and welcome back to the Worcester Senior Center Stay Connected Programming on Channel 192. My name is Suki Lapin, and I am the Program Coordinator at the Worcester Senior Center. Today, we are offering beginner photography lessons. Interested in taking pictures to share with family and friends? Have a smartphone, small digital camera, professional digital camera, a film camera, or any other camera? Learn the basic skills of photography to improve your skills. Duncan Calder, photographer, former Worcester Senior Center technology intern, Clark University alum, and current grad student will conduct three sessions. Session one is intro to photography techniques. Session two will be advanced photography techniques. And session three is showcasing and discussing your work. Welcome, Duncan Calder. Thank you. Um, it's nice to kind of help out with this and present my experience in photography. Um, we'll see if this is helpful to anyone and if we can get some good ideas flowing here. All right, so as uh, Suki already said about me, I'm a photographer. I've been taking pictures for uh, probably near a decade. I grew up with digital cameras from my my family and moved into more and more cameras and did a studio art minor at Clark University over the last four years and did some film photography there as well as some focus in graphic design. Um, I'm currently finishing up my master's in science and information technology at the university and am working at the UMass Medical School um, full time. So one thing I just want to start off with to the very stresses was mentioned in the introduction is what you have, whatever camera you have is going to be just as good as anyone else's camera. So just to use whatever camera you have, a lot of people have um, a smartphone that they can use, whether it's an iPhone or Android phone, you could, they can use that to take pictures or uh, what's called the dumb phone which is just any other mobile phone, cell phone often that has a camera that you can use to take pictures. Going on to other devices, you can maybe have like an iPod or an MP3 player that you can use to take pictures. If you have more experience when taking pictures, you can use a DSLR, which is a digital camera that you can take pictures with, as well as an SLR, which is a film camera that have kind of gone out of style just because they've been replaced by other cameras and then other film cameras that maybe have different setups or anything else that may develop any photo in some way, um, as well as a mirrorless camera, which I have, which is made because you can have a different sort of shutter in order to take pictures. But mostly it's just whatever you have to take pictures it's a form of art and as with any other art, there's no limit to how you can express yourself using the art and what you can use to capture the world around us. And that's the purpose of it. Um, this photo off to the side was a photo I took many years ago on um, an iPod touch, which wasn't a very great piece of technology, but it had a camera and I used that for many years to take pictures and it's just a way to showcase that even if you might not have a fancy camera, fancy phone or fancy device, you can use whatever you have to take pictures as long as you have an idea of how to capture the world around you and how to represent what you see in a way for other people to understand the beauty and the energy that you felt in the moment. So I'll go over some terms, starting off with some photography terms, what parts of the camera there are. Um, there's the shutter, which is now usually just a button. That's the mechanism used to take picture on a phone. That's often just a button on the screen or maybe that you have to select to take a picture. Um, there's the frame, which is just the viewable area covered by the camera. Um, I'll use frame a bunch during this to talk about how to organized objects or subjects in your frame in order to come off as a representation of what you're seeing. The viewfinder is the 
screen or area you'd use to preview the photo for taking it again on a phone that's just the screen on the phone but you could have a camera that has a little small viewfinder that you can look through in order to see what picture you're taking and then of course the lens which is whatever glass element you have to focus the light coming into the camera that makes it so that you can actually capture the photo from the real world into whatever format that you're taking the picture for. And then some information about composing. Subject is just what you want people to look at in the photo. Um, there could be multiple subjects. So if you have a picture in this instance here of our, these little daisies where you have one flower in the foreground. Um, so that's kind of in front of everything that is in focus. And then there's another flower in the background that often people might look at as well. That could also be a subject, but isn't the main subject in focus. And then you have the background, which here is the green leaves and everything below the flowers that users and people who are looking at photo don't necessarily see when they're first looking at that. So reference foreground and background a couple times in this as just what you want people to look at and what you want to form as the kind of basis of what the image is to give context to what the foreground shows. So for composing an image, there's mostly infinite ways you can compose a photograph. Um, generally, people use centering, so putting image in the very center of the frame. Um, it gives some space between the subjects and the edge of the frame. It's often what's used for portraits. So if you're taking a picture of maybe a friend or family member, then you can center the object or the person in the middle of the frame so that they're the first thing someone sees, but you can also see the background around them to see where they are and see more of the situation that you're the person you're taking pictures in. In this instance, we have a picture of the Grand Canyon and we have an outcropping that fills up the center of the frame and is what you would call the subject. And then the background, which is a continuing wall of the canyon, while the subject is centered and is mostly what you're gonna see, the background gives context to what people might look for later when they're looking on the image to admire it and think about what that the picture is about and what there is to see there. There are other ways of composing images. Um, you can use grid lines, which is just ways to separate out the image in uh, in your frame. So quarters, it's just as maybe you can understand, it's splitting up the image into quarters, so into fourth. So you have maybe the first fourth, second, third, fourth, and then the same thing up and down. So in this instance, this photo here, the light, the light bulb would likely be the subject of the photo. And that's in closer to the lower right corner of the picture. So even though it's not in the center of the picture, it still is the subject and still is um, something that is aesthetically pleasing because it also shows the rest of the image and also shows what's around it and has some lines, leading lines, which kind of bring your eyes around the image for what to look at. Leading lines are just any object in the photo that has direction to it. So in this case, you have the pole that leads up to the light that has direction. So it brings your eyes into the image and then you have the arm coming off of the, the lamp post that brings your eyes further into the image and then down to the light. So a big example of what you could use as leading lines is just railroad tracks. So if you think of, if you had a picture of railroad tracks, then those tracks would go off into the distance. And when you look at a photo of railroad tracks or if you're there in person, then you start looking where it's biggest, where it's closest, so where you can see the tracks and look off into the distance to see where they go. 
that's the idea of leading lines. It's something that helps lead your eyes around the image so that you can see what there is to see and kind of traverse it as if you were seen or a book or if you were there, or what you would see first, second, third, fourth. So talking about lighting here, um, for brightness, there's a couple different sections of brightness. Um, for start, you've got highlights. So those are the brightest parts of the image. Often the sky, in this instance, you have a light from a lighthouse. So that is the highlight in this image. It's the brightest part. And sometimes if it's too bright, like in this instance, you have a light that's too bright, it's been blown out. So you've lost all definition. So in this case, you can't see the, um, you can't see the wreath on the lighthouse and the window as well because the white bright light is too bright and you can't see the colors there. Um, and then there's the shadows, which is just the darkest parts of the image. And if they get too dark, then it gets noisy and definition and quality is lost. As you can see in this image, there is kind of some modeled colors up in the kind of darkness of where the night would be. That is the noise that we're talking about here. So it's when the camera doesn't really know how to represent those colors and those sections of the image that it shows up as noise as it can't understand what color it should be. And that's something that also should be avoided. So when you're putting together an image, then you wanna try to figure out what parts are gonna be too bright and what parts are gonna be too dark, and then take a picture to balance out the bright and then the dark sections. So in this picture, we have a flower. So you would want the flower to be the focus of the image. So you don't want it to be too bright. And then you've got the background, which is the water. And you don't want the water to be the focus of the image because then you wouldn't be able to see the flower. So if you were here in real life, you would probably pretty well be able to see the flower and the water, but cameras aren't as perfect as our eyes are, or they don't represent the world as well as our eyes do. So it can't see, a picture won't be able to see both the flower and the background of the water. So you need to choose what you want to represent. In this case, I chose to look at the flower and have the focus on the flower and have the brightness to be adjusted so that for the flower looks at the right brightness level. And then the background is mostly dark. You can't see any detail in it because that's not really where I want the person who's looking at the photo to really focus their eyes on. Um, when I was editing this photo, I adjusted it so that I kept the background dark because I didn't want to confuse anyone looking at this picture. Um, I didn't want them to think that they want, they should be looking at the background instead of the flower in the foreground. And that is how you generally want to expose for a photo. Now, when you're just going out and taking a picture, um, it's hard to kind of think of all of this, to think of where the bright parts are and the dark parts are and how you can adjust for that. But for the most part, try to look at what you're seeing and think about if it's something's gonna be too bright. Maybe if you're taking a picture inside, um, inside probably looks like it's bright enough, but um, in comparison to windows outside, it might end up being too dark and you might not be able to see as well as you can in a picture that you're taking inside, then maybe your eyes could see. Um, that is often what sometimes people have um, issues with, getting the brightness correct on a photo. And people could definitely have photos where the flower isn't as at the same brightness as I have here. 
that was looking into the background, but it's mostly um, choice of who's taking the picture in order to do that. So um, that's a generic picture, but um, after this, I kind of want to see what people want to learn about if people have experience with taking pictures and what kind of experience there is, that, that is and what um, brought people to come and listen to me talk about photography and um, learn more about taking pictures. Um, and then going off into the next sessions, I also wanna see and hear about what people like taking pictures of, what their favorite photos are, um, favorite artists, and um, see if people have photos that they can share that we can talk about and discuss what they, what the good parts of them are and how they use some of the things I'm talking about and what people have learned in the past about photography to create a really good photo that represents a situation well. If anyone's able to talk, um, I'd like to know if anyone else takes pictures and what kind of experience they have with them. Um, I take lots of pictures of my grandchildren and I'd like to really be able to take pictures that I can then paint from. So I want to really take good pictures of them. And I think I have a pretty decent camera. It's a uh, Nikon, it's a DX. I know I could have a better one and better lenses, but for my purposes, it's okay. But I want to learn more about using it the right way. And again, more about taking a good picture. Of course. And um, what experience have you had with, um, I guess, not taking a good picture? Um, what seems to um, not meet your expectations when you take pictures? I get a lot of red eye. Of course, I can take that out when I put mm -hmm. it on the computer. Um, and um, I don't know more about like, you know, really getting close up and having like your background fade out. You know, I want to take a picture maybe somewhere um, at the beach or, you know, in the woods or something like that. Um, have a nice background, but that's faded out and the focus is on the, on the children. Um, and, you know, I've just, I've, I've taken some terrible pictures. <laughs> They've been awful. I'm like, oh my God, I'll chop heads off, you know, but I don't mm -hmm. have feet in the picture. You get the person, but like the lighting's off, you know, um, things like that. Yeah. And as I said earlier, the camera doesn't matter so much. Um, it's mostly what you do with it. Mm -hmm. um, I can I, I can talk with about um, more about focusing and how to take pictures like that. Uh, generally, what I think about when I'm taking pictures of people, um, this instance, you're taking pictures of your grandchildren, is what's behind them. It's just being aware of that. Often when I'm taking pictures, I end up taking pictures that don't work out well because they have too busy of a background. Um, I guess how I would describe busyness in a background is having a lot going on. So if we look at some of the other pictures here, um, maybe this one is, a, is an example of, you've got the background faded out, but there, there's still like objects in the background, a lot of, lot of lines. Mm -hmm. If there, if maybe there was like a, a person in the background, then this wouldn't be a good, so much of a good picture because it would be distracting to see a person in the background um, especially if they're not faded out enough. Um, the kind of fading is just caused by things that are out of focus. Um, without getting too technical, um, things, there's greater difference between what's in focus and what's out of focus based on um, how the lens focuses light and the aperture of the lens that you have. And then also the kind of length of the lens you have. So if you have like a, a big lens that really zooms people in a lot when you take pictures, it's more likely that when you take a picture, the background would be faded out. So if the background's really far away and you're taking a picture of someone close up, then likely the background would be faded away so you don't see it anymore. Um, so you want to kind of maybe at the beach, maybe that'll be a good 
instance of being able to get that kind of photo where the backgrounds fall away so that you can easily get that fading effect. But also um, brightness comes into effect there where if you're, if it's like a bright sunny day, then your camera's not going to want to take in a lot of light. So there's going to be too much light to able to be accurately represented on the photo. So it needs to um, close off the camera to some light, which then makes it so that the background isn't as um, isn't as blurry, isn't as faded out. Um, for the most part, when taking pictures of people, as you kind of already mentioned, just trying to focus a lot on the composing. So where you want to put them in the picture. Um, if you want to have maybe one person in the center and the background, whatever it's going to be, or maybe if you have a couple people, maybe you put them kind of in the center, but even out so that you can see other things. Um, and that's, that's kind of the general idea. I know that it's kind of hard to get, get out of the moment and really focus on taking pictures um, of, of something. You just wanna keep your face away, away from the camera instead of um, to actually experience life. Did that help at all or did that? No, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying, yes. I'll, I'll make a note to talk more about that in the, uh, in the next, next session, going into more advanced techniques about what you can do, especially with a camera like yours, where you might have more access to settings to take pictures where you can, you can have a faded out background and, and that kind of stuff. Sounds good. <laughs> Does anyone else have any experience with taking photos that um, they have questions about things I can talk about in the next session. Um, yes, hi there. Um, this is Carla. Um, I was traveling a lot before COVID, and I was taking a lot of architectural pictures or um, landscapes. Uh, you know, travel travel pictures. Not no pe not really anybody. No people, pretty much. And it seemed that I was having, um, they were either too bright or too dark. So I guess you'd call it lighting problems. Um, so I guess that was um, maybe um, some uh, challenges I was having. Yeah, and what kind of camera did you usually use when taking these pictures of architecture um, and traveling? Usually, usually my iPhone. Okay. Um, yeah. Or, or I had an inexpensive, um, you know, uh, digital camera that I, okay. I would also use that too if whatever I had that day. Yeah, good to know. Um, I really like taking architecture pictures. It's really interesting to be able to play around with composing, either having the lines of buildings line up directly with the sides of the frames or kind of right. aligning things differently. Um, the first picture I have, it's blurred out, but this was a picture of um, the, of some buildings in the center of Worcester. And it actually got into a, a competition in with Arts Worcester and it was, it was purchased by someone in Paxton, which is very cool to see. Um, but with, with taking pictures like that, as you have experienced, it's hard to get um, a good balance of lighting. And especially because there might be parts of the image that are kind of shadowed because you've got harsh lines of buildings or maybe um, wherever you are in architecture. And with an iPhone, you can you can tap on the screen to focus to where you want it to focus, but that also adjusts the brightness. So if you maybe have a um, like a dark spot in the image that you want the camera to focus on, you can try to tap on that spot on your phone screen 
and it'll focus there and then it'll adjust exposuring. So it just how much light it's taking in or not to bring out oh, that so section. It, um, if, if I may, I'm actually um, um, holding my phone now. So you're saying uh, like with my iPhone, I, mm -hmm. um, it'll make that little square trying to find out what I'm focusing on. And it has a little, um, uh, like a, uh, like a sun. So you're saying, yeah. what, what would I do with that? So if you just tap on where you want the camera to focus, it'll move that little square to that point and it'll focus there. So if I, yeah. I can, let's see if I'm able to share my screen here. This isn't very interesting because it's my wall, but if we have here, I can tap and it shows where yeah. it's focusing. So that gray box there. So if I maybe huh? want to focus on the chair, it'll refocus there. If I want to tap on the shadow there, it'll do it there. Um, especially if you have something like this where you've got, I've got a wall here and then a wall back there. You can tap around to where you want to focus and it'll readjust that. And then the sun, if you like tap where you want to focus and then you slide up and down, it'll adjust the brightness there as well. Ah, never knew that. That's, that's good to know. Interesting. So, okay. Do you have some more tips for the using the iPhone, Duncan? Yeah, of course. Um, let's Good. see if I, have, I don't have my phone near me. But one thing I really like to do with um, kind of iPhone photography is you can also do a panorama. Does anyone, has anyone taken a panorama on their phone before? No. Is that called no. pano on the phone? Yes, pano. Oh, I never did. <laughs> so that's why, that's why I'm at your beginner class. <laughs> well, there you go. That's what I'm, that's what I'm here for. Um, I like going hiking with my family. So often when I'm at top of a mountain or even just at a kind of a lookout, I like to go to the pano setting and it instructs you what to do. But what you can do is move your phone slowly across the landscape that you're trying to capture and it'll take a long photo of that. And then you can kind of go back and see all of what you're looking at in a view that you might not be able to see before where you may be just looking one specific direction. It widens the frame so that you can see the, across the entire landscape. Um, so that's something that I really like to do. That's probably the most often feature on my, on my phone that I use. Um, and to access that, you just kind of swipe down here to get to, um, to get to pano and then it says move continuously while taking a panorama and you can put that together to take that picture. Huh. Hmm. Thank you. So when you're moving it, do you, how do you activate it? Cause it's not, it, how do you, do you, do you hit pano again? So you, you press the shutter button on either on the screen or you can actually use the uh, volume buttons on the phone as well. And then it'll make a little ding noise and it'll show the progress of the arrow pointing to how you're, how you're moving to be able to take the picture. Okay. So here, if I go to Pano, if I go click here, there's nothing to take a picture of here but it'll say keep an arrow on the center line. And if I slowly turn my iPad, it'll follow that line and take a panorama of my surroundings here. And then once it's done, it'll stop and you can uh, share your photo. Oh, thank you. And I'm trying to find some examples of some really great panoramas I've taken on my camera to kind of show what you can do. Cause I also have a couple where it's, um, where they're done in an architectural setting to show more of what, um, what I'm seeing. 
You gotta be steady with that though, right? That's what I yes. <laughs> gotta be real steady. Yeah, so often I um, put it like right up against me so that I can turn with it or um, or make it so that you can you can be steady. So here's one that I took a couple years ago where I took, it was probably like two or three pictures and put them together into this photo where you can see more of, of the surroundings. So it's not only this nice kind of colonial style looking apartment building, but you can also see the buildings around it to experience more of the, of the place than if you're just looking at one, one building across from this field. Hmm. And when, when you said you put that together, was that a combination of different panel films or just one long panel shot? So on my camera, I don't have an automatic um, panoramic mode, so pano mode. Um, so I took multiple pictures and then on my the software I use to edit photos um, Adobe Lightroom I was able to then have the the computer stitch them together so figure out where one started and one ended and then one started and one ended so that it would be able to then see the entire entire screen there and in one situation I put maybe like 10 photos together to get this absolutely huge picture together of um, a mountain I just just climbed. So this was the photo that I took that it's on top of Mount Jefferson up in the White Mountains. So it was a bunch of photos that I took and then put together to be able to have this huge photo of the surroundings that um, um that really shows the experience better than just one little frame might show. So if you go through this entire thing, you see the mountains going off into the distance and you see the clouds and well, over here we have Mount Washington um, that kind of really represented my experience more than maybe just one photo. So that's kind of a little trick you can do to use your phone to be able to show what maybe one photo or one description of this of the scene might not be able to show. Mm. Beautiful. So, um, so far I've got that next time I can talk about um, kind of focusing and how to frame for when you have like a single subject and making the background kind of fade away well. Um, probably choosing choosing backgrounds is probably a good idea to talk about. Um, maybe going more into how to expose an image, especially on an iPhone, because it seems like a good amount of people have iPhones that they use. Um, and then also talking about maybe some other tricks for using phones to take pictures and what kind of what experience we have with them. Um, the same kind of thing of that I was explaining with the tap to focus, you can also do with um, other cameras. It's it can be a bit hard to to master, but often when you're using the shutter on a camera, um, so the button to take pictures, you can press it down like halfway, and it won't take the picture yet. It'll just focus. So. In the instance that maybe I want to take a picture of something and I want the focus point to be not the center of the image, where maybe the camera wants it to be the center of the image, then I can half press on the shutter and then kind of move my camera and it'll stay focused on that first place. Um, so it's kind of with the phone where you it wants to focus either wherever it decides to or in the center. You can decide exactly where you want it to focus and where the brightness shows up so that you can, you can really tweak the picture to your liking if it doesn't 
it doesn't think that you you want something that you actually do want. Is there any, any other questions that people have that I can address now or make note to talk about more next session? So also if you have some, some pictures that you, you wanna talk about, or as I said earlier, some uh, photographers or kind of situations that you wanna talk more about next time, um, I'd be happy to, um, to take them. Um, I, I think that maybe, maybe, let's see, I don't know if, if you'll be able to send me pictures, um, but if you bring stuff up next time, then I'd be happy to, to talk about them. Um, I can maybe provide my, my email so that people can, can send any pictures or send any, um, any questions they have to me so that I can talk about them next time and really make this work for what people want from this, these sessions. I'm not sure if people can see it. I can maybe have Suki send an email later, but um, my email address is dcalder13 at icloud.com. Um, and you're welcome to send any pictures or anything you want to be talked about in the next session or artists. And I'll be happy to, to talk about it and add it to my, my slides for what to talk about either next week or the week after when we'll talk about and showcase everyone's photos or anything they want to show. Um, Duncan, could I ask you about a couple of the features on my iPhone camera? A couple of, of the, I guess, the icons I've, I've never quite understood. Yeah. So um, there's uh, four icons up at the top. Mm -hmm. um, what do they mean? What? So if I know what you're looking at, um, there should be, there's often like a, a button that looks like a, like it's got like a clock hand on it. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's gonna be like a self timer. So if you tap on that, it'll give you options that says like off 3S or 10S. So if you select one of those options, then you can choose to have a three second timer or a 10 second timer. So then when you ah. press the shutter button, it'll let you know that you have how long you have left until it takes a picture. So this is really good if maybe you need time to get re ready for a picture or um, such as if you like set up your phone somewhere so that you can take a group picture, you can set that off so that you can have it take a picture maybe 10 seconds in the future so that you can get everyone ready to take the picture then. Okay, excellent, okay. And then there should be like a lightning bolt. Do you see that as well? Is that one of the icons? I so that's gonna be the flash. So um, most phones and most cameras have a flash. Um, it was mentioned earlier with kind of a, a not a phone camera with red eye and if you use that, then it'll set off the little light on the front of your phone to brighten up the scene. Um, this is will only automatically go on if maybe you're in a dark room or you're inside and it needs more light. I don't often use the flash because as was mentioned, it creates a red eye, which is just from a reflection inside of the iris. It reflects some light back and makes it so it looks like the eye has turned red. And you can remove that later and most um, systems automatically remove that now, but um, it's just something to understand that you could have uh, a weird looking iris with that. So, so then- do you, you normally have 
have you oh I'm sorry, you normally have that on off rather than auto? It depends on the situation. Um if I'm inside and there's like no way I can take a picture without it being blurry, then I will have to turn it on. But um for the most part I'm outside. I'm don't often take pictures inside because I'm often doing things out walking around in the woods or something. So I don't often need that. And um, sometimes it goes, the flash goes off at situations where I don't want it. Like if you're outside in the woods and maybe the camera thinks it's a bit too dark, um, it might do the flash, but it makes, gives it an artificial look to pictures that I only really would want when I'm inside uh, and not when I'm outside. What what is the icon um, either H the A D R? What does that do, or what is that? So that has to do with lighting. It stands for high dynamic range, and what it does is it takes a series of photos, usually a bright photo, a medium photo, and then a dark photo, and it takes those pictures and combines them together into one photo. So as you might be able to tell with uh, most cameras is that you can't have the bright parts of the image and the dark parts of the image in like perfect exposure at the same time. You have to either choose to focus for the bright and the dark. Um, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying with the highlights and the shadows. If I go back to my presentation for a second. So in this situation where you've got a lot of dark and a lot of light and they, you can't, if you brighten up the image to get the dark to look right, then the bright parts will not be right. All of this to say is that the HDR tries to get it so that you have the bright parts and the dark parts in focus, in exposed when the center is also also exposed. So if you're taking a picture of a sunset, for example, and you have maybe your house in the foreground, then it'll take a picture where it has the sunset exposed right and then the house exposed right and puts those together so that you have the sunset and you have your house and you can see them both at the same time without having one of them too bright or one of them too dark. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So if I, if that was, if that was uh, the subject I was trying to do, so then I would, I would tap on the HDR is what you're saying to take the picture. Exactly. And that's usually huh? on um, auto or you can tell it to be on. And I believe when it is on that little button will go yellow. So it shows you that it is on and then it'll oh. take the pictures in accordance. So you just need to make sure that you're holding your phone steady because if you're moving it around when it's taking those photos, then it won't be able to combine them together in the way you want them to, or it'll kind of have some weird aspects of the image that just don't look right. Maybe there's lines that shouldn't be there because the three pictures that it took aren't able to go together correctly. Okay, so that would be, so that HDR button should be on for, Sounds probably more like outside pictures rather than inside pictures. Is that right? Yeah. It depends okay. on where you are inside, but it's often used. I also often use it outside to make sure I'm, I get that okay. right. Excellent. And then the final icon over to the far right, when I tap on it, I, it brings up, you know, nine picture, uh, nine frames. What does that mean? So that's going to be, um, I believe, let's see if I have that on my, um, I don't, but oh, that's okay. probably going to be, uh, you have like different filters you can put on. Um, so probably show kind of this, the frame you're looking at your screen in different like colors. So maybe there'll be one that's really bluish, one that's really yellowish, or maybe there would be a black and white one in there. So those are just kind of filters or ideas that maybe if you want a 
pictures to look a certain way. If you're taking pictures of something maybe old and if you want it to have black and white look to it, then you can tap on the black and white picture and then it'll have the picture in black and white. Um, does that sound like what you're looking at there? Oh, maybe, yeah. Now I don't have to know how to turn it off. <laughs> I oh, believe no. if, you, if you go back to the same button, you can turn it off now. Yeah, I'm I'm tapping it. I was kind of playing with it, and now, now I can't seem to turn it. It seems like it's it's been activated, and maybe if I just uh, close out my camera, maybe. If you see one that says normal or at least looks normal, then you can select that, and it'll go back to normal. Otherwise, oh, if me... you select any of the squares, then it'll go into what that filter is. Right. Oh, oh, I found, okay, I found it said none. Perfect. Oh, yep. thank you. There we go. Thank you so perfect. Much. There we go. I couldn't get out of it. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay, none. Great. Boy, well, this has been incredibly helpful just having me understand my phone. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it's unfortunate that um, they don't have more instructions when you have a phone for how to use the camera because there's a lot of really good features for using the camera. I could... I could definitely take a lot of incredible pictures with just my my phone camera without even having to go to my my main camera that I used to take pictures. It's really it's really great what they do now. Right, right. Well, ironically, um, the Apple Store used to have um, camera lessons, or in, mm. and when the store was open, now they do not. They they, they don't. So you can't even touch their phone for sales. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe this will be um, this will be helpful for people who are trying to do that as well. Yes. Well, very. now you can teach people. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're an expert now. Yes. <laughs> Only with the camera, but now I need to know the rest of my phone. <laughs> <laughs> And um, other other phones that people have, um, like Android phones or like Google phone, they often have similar settings or similar abilities than iPhone. So what you can do on one phone, you can often do on other phones as well. And um, it's as long as you can kind of tap around on things as we kind of showed there, and you'll eventually fi figure out settings that maybe you didn't know exist and. There's not too much that you can't undo if you um, tap on to see filters and you don't know how to get back. You can always close out of the app again or just see what else yeah. you can do to get, get around to get to what you want to do. Yeah, excellent. Does anyone else have any questions or that we might be all set for the night and we can uh, reconvene next week and see what else we can learn? Yeah, that'd be good. Sounds good. Great. All right. Well, thanks for coming. It was nice to hear from everyone and um, Thank you, talk Duncan. about my experience with uh, with photography. I'm really, really happy to share what um, what I know and hope everyone gets a lot from this so that you can take more pictures. Thank you. Good job, Thank Duncan. You, Duncan. Excellent, Duncan. Uh, this was wonderful programming. Um, thank you so much. Stay safe, stay hydrated, and stay connected by watching the Worcester Senior Center Stay Connected programming on Channel 192.